Dr. Gatenio, having just finished the 140 lessons of English the Silent Way, I would like to turn to the concerns of uh, those people who will be using it, program directors and teachers. And I think that uh, one of the questions uh, that many people will have will be exactly why, why is there no teacher? Why are there only students teaching other students? Well, this is a very simple question indeed. <coughs> Since uh, we are teaching through television and not in the classroom, the medium has to be the teacher. And if I understand what television does on me, which is to affect me by its content, not by the directors, uh, I don't see any of the producers, any of the people who are involved. I see the story. I see the people, the actors, and they seem to be in life. So what I want to put is a show which is uh, indicating to the people who want to get into the, the English language, in this case, uh, uh, people who are getting into it. And therefore, all they are going to experience is what the students experience. Yes, but the, normally when we're watching a television show, uh, we don't think of it in terms of uh, correctness or rightness, uh, the rightness of an answer. Uh, and these are, these are people who, who don't speak English. Uh, they're learning the language. How are they supposed to indicate to the students uh, at home whether the answer is right or wrong, or whether they have the criteria for, for judging whether it's right or wrong at home? Well, uh, go going to back to, to you as a baby, when you produced a sound, whichever sound you produced, uh, your mother was so happy. Everybody was so pleased with what you did. They didn't say, because he's learning English, he should produce uh, the sound at once in perfection. And we are concerned with learning. We can accept. We can accept that some of the things that are being done require that uh, someone says it differently. But saying it differently goes to the ear. And the sounds are produced from inside, from within, through the throat, through a voluntary system. So if those students produce whatever they produce, you can say, that's their production, not what they heard. And until you transfer from what you say to what you hear, you don't have criteria here. The criteria uh, don't come from the package of energy that the voice puts onto the eardrum. It comes from the analysis that this doesn't matter, this doesn't matter, this, uh, this matters, that particular thing. And then this sort of discrimination that all of us as babies do, I want the students to do again. And I want to do it fast, and mistakes are part of learning. I cannot eliminate mistake and say I'm presenting learning. Yes, but what is, the <coughs> what is the value of a mistake for someone at home? You don't have a mother to smile at you. There's no teacher to smile at you. How do we know? Still, still, uh, since I am present in the classroom in the background, and since I have devised uh, the techniques of colors to indicate that this is the thing to do, you, as a learner, get the clues that the students don't seem to get. And you, can, you may be able to say, I know what I should say. Why these this fools, or whatever you call them, don't do it? And if they do it, the criterion being available for the viewer, he could say, this one, that one on the corner that is doing it, and the one next to him is not doing it. I don't know why. I'm doing it, too. Well, I, d I don't. I, I see what you're getting at, but since television is a very selective medium, and since, uh, for example, at one particular point, uh, one person's voice may be emphasized rather than another, uh, and that may be a, a gross error in terms of the production. But it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Uh, what I have learned in my studies of learning is that until you have criteria, whatever, if it's right or wrong, it doesn't, doesn't produce any effect. While if you are, we are with criteria. Then you know who is right and who is wrong. And the whole lesson is built toward cr generating criteria, which don't come from the fact that I say the right thing. Imagine, listen at me, to me now. I speak English spontaneously, freely. I've been uh, for uh, 37 years uh, immersed in uh, English-speaking countries. Do you see me as someone who says what I heard or what I produce? what you produce. Of course. Yes. And I'm not ashamed of what I do with English. 
because it's what I do. And, uh, and you can't ask of me that I do what you did when you were a baby. And therefore, I meet my students on the basis they are. And in fact, who can deny them that they have come out with statements that sounded English so much better than people who have taken hundreds and hundreds of hours through the ear? Well, you know which that are. You are a teacher of language, Mr. Rosell. You know what, uh, uh, what people do when they get it through the ear. Yes, it's much more difficult than produce it through a voluntary system. Well, you're speaking of criteria. Exactly what do you mean by criteria? What is the criteria of, of, of a sound? What well, say, how are they supposed uh, to know what these criteria are? If, if I say, where, 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 and instead of where, if I say most instead of most, the O in most has two sounds. There is a criterion. I have to indicate that there are two sounds in that O, while they see one round thing and they say O. Oh. So they don't have criteria. So if in English there was correspondence, one sound, one sign, and then it would be all right. That is not the case. Therefore, they, I have to give them criteria, which is, in the, in the case of making sounds, the color. Yes, but the colors at the beginning, uh, you spoke of the, you've spoken of the, the rectangles, the colored rectangles, which are often uh, when divided did I into two. That? In the last show. Oh. Yes. Uh, but the, the spellings of English uh, are extremely complex, and every time they see uh, uh, an O, they, they mustn't say O, uh, and they can't go around with colors course, in their heads all the of time. Of course, I don't want them to guess. Uh, there are 10 sounds for the letter A in English, 11 for the letter O, 9 for the letter U. Now, who is going to ask the students to remember these things? So I have colored them. And if you look at what serves as a background to us here, this chart there, behind you. It contains in column all the spellings for one particular sound. So there are special lessons to indicate to which of these you go for that word. If I say mail, the one for the post, you write it in one way. If I say mail for a man, you write it another way. And if I say straight or eight, I mean other way. So I have to establish this connection as the choices of the inventors of that, that language, not it's mine. Granted, granted. But uh, for example, I still have trouble spelling certain words in English. But uh, it, you know, it's taken me 33 years to to reach a point where, or let's say, it took me 16 years. I don't know. But these people don't have 16 years. How can they possibly acquire this so rapidly? Well, if, if I wasn't around, they may take 21 years. But since I'm here, they take 21 days. And that's the job. You see, that's the role of the teacher. His function is to produce situations which are so chiseled, so precise, that the students focus on the point they want to make. And I can't say that all my lessons are perfectly chiseled because I'm struggling with too many components. But I try to make them so precise that you, you only work on that particular thing. And I don't want to, to have them distracted by my voice, by uh, the, the state of mind in which I am. I want to be on the background altogether. I want them to, to work precisely with that what's needed. And I can point. By pointing at one particular sign, they are, they are alerted that the, the mistake was in this, not in everything. In fact, one of the observations that I, I would make as I made as teacher, and you can make it again and again, and everybody has made it, is that your students who make a sentence, if they have four words that they know how to do and the fifth they don't know how to do, they go 20 times through the four they know how to do instead of working directly on the one. So that has to be eliminated. We don't want what they know. We want to work on what they don't know. Yes, but isn't it through working what, uh, on what they know that they gain the facility that is so important in, in, in well, the language? But you see, if they know it, I don't have to work on it. It's an absurdity to take time 
to do the things that they know. That's why I begin with the sounds of their language, because they know them. I don't have to teach them what they know. And it is uh, a, an idea of teachers that you only know things by reducing the unknown to the known. What I'm suggesting is that you go towards the unknown. You go towards what you are, with what you have. And if there are combinations that exist in English that don't exist in Chinese or French or Japanese or whatever we have had in our classes, then they will have to work on these new things, these new distinctions with what they have. And by uniformizing what they know and what they have to know, by giving them the bridge from what they know to what they have to acquire, say by putting two colors of the two sounds that they already know to make one. I'm, I'm economizing, saving them years of effort. So, but coming back to the idea of facility, how can a, if at each step they meet a new problem, doesn't that new problem block them in the development of the, the facility of the language? Well, uh, there is no doubt that in order to acquire a, a considerable facility, it's not enough to look at the half hours of the, the tape that we have produced. I say considerable facility. But if you are concerned with facility only, a certain facility, you can do it entirely with the tape because they were conceived so that whenever possible, they don't require anything but what is seen and what is heard. And the, the errors that the students make are the ones on which I, as a teacher, behind the, the scene, behind the lights, behind the cameras, work on, so that I force their awareness that if you did this and that, it would be acceptable, acceptable to me, and therefore, by extension, to everybody. Well, we come back to, if we, if we come to the problem of a facility, of gaining considerable uh, facility, which is similar to what people discuss when they talk about the levels of, of a language, um, what level will a person reach, uh, having done the uh, the, the 140 hours, uh, or 140 lessons. And also, uh, what level is this material uh, adapted, uh, adapted for? Well, uh, I cannot say what people with talent will do with a work of art like this series. They will do what they want. They may wreck it, they may make marvelous things that I wouldn't know what to do. Therefore, I'm not going to to legislate and to tell people, you do it this way or that way. All I can say is that we have conceived of presenting these materials through the medium of television, which generates limitations. These limitations have to be taken care of by another device, which is that we, we tell teachers who are going to use this to come in between lessons or after a certain number of lessons and get the students to work over that, that area that was covered through the materials that were presented in the classroom situation. For instance, this material that is behind us appears in the last lesson, last two lessons only, because it occupies too big an area and can't be seen properly on television. But it is essential to have it up on the wall from the start, because the rectangles that we have devised to, to be an instrument that the television camera can take is the summary of this one. The, so this one being on the wall, if there is enough space on the wall, you put it up. And as they see something on television, they can turn around and they recognize that the order has been observed in the sequence of the rectangles, the order of, of appearance of the colors in this, but they will see columns. And in each of these columns, they will see lots of, of designs in Latin uh, alphabet. So those who, who don't have the Latin alphabet who get into this, and there are many, many cultures that don't have it in ancient uh, civilizations with perhaps uh, a billion and a half or two billion people in them who have not learned to this alphabet. We have prepared a transition from those things that they can see, which 
uh, trigger sounds to, the, to this remaining with a certain number of designs. And we ask them to learn to use these designs. And after a while, they are as familiar with this set, the huge set that is behind us, as they are with that rectangle. And you know that they became familiar, some of them, in about three or four half hours with this uh, set of rectangles. They could do things in two or three, or say three hours, four hours, eight hours, which is a very small number of hours uh, compared to the demands of the phonetics of English. Well, at the same time, you assume that there will be a transfer from the, from the rectangles to, to the charts that, is behind, the charts that are behind us. If, if, they do, if they are alone in the classroom and they don't have any of this, these materials, the reduced, uh, we have produced the reduced uh, sets which are for individual students, but if they are in a, in a group, in a class, then the transfer is done with the help of the teacher who comes after a certain number of, uh, of lessons have been due, and then tests that there has been transfer or not. If not, look, go back to the states that you've seen before. You see, in, in here, in our experiment here, our uh, students in, at the back, who were not in the studio, were doing things which were simultaneously and only once. It was an artificial situation. And in spite of these restrictions, the students there functioned very well and perhaps better than the ones I had in my own class. And so imagine what would happen if you are in your own classroom, which is yours, where a group of three or four, they can put the tape, they can note at which, more or less at which number of uh, uh, of uh, cycles, they obtained uh, this difficulty and put it back just there to, to view it again. There is a possibility that students who are uh, full of initiative can learn by themselves on their own using the tape and the machine. But doesn't that come down to sort of uh, repetition and, uh, well, I don't know. How could be repetition when, when you, you see, uh, can you say that when you skip a rope, when you learn to skip a rope, it is repetition, or is it that you t take yourself further than from where you were, were and you ask questions uh, bodily, the physical questions, somatic questions of yourself, and you say, can I do it by lifting one foot after the other, or something of the kind? It's not repetition, it's variation. And uh, the, the repetition that you are there is a conscious thing. You say, I did not get that, I want to get it. And you go and put it again, and it may be a second, just a second to say, now I got it. And you move ahead. But how is that different from, for example, working on a, I don't know, on a, on a tape, on an audio tape, uh, with uh, uh, a same, the same sentence coming over and over and just changing one word in it? But in, in this case, they don't come over and over again. When, when you hear the same said several times, is that each of the students in the class has been given a chance. And since they are making different mistakes, they make the mistakes they make, not the same mistakes. They make the mistakes they make. The students viewing that uh, will be selecting where in which of the spectrum of the one who does it who does very badly and the one who does almost as well as, as I would uh, consider it to be good. And in between, in that spectrum, someone will fall and will say, I want to see whether I can do better than so and so who is my guide. I think it's a much more complex thing than the thought that drilling sell, serves education. In fact, it doesn't. I have heard hundreds and thousands of people speak English to me. And look at the English I produce. It's mine, just as yours as your, is yours. But because uh, it's labeled American English, people think that you speak American English when you speak Roselle's English. And I speak my English. Yes, but th isn't the same. The same necessarily applies to someone who, who learns the language through repetition. He's still using his own vocal apparatus, his own voice to produce the language, well, even if he repeats it. I, I have no objection to people who learn through repetition, if they learn. I'm concerned with those who don't learn through repetition. And there are lots of them, lots of them. I started teaching languages, I wouldn't tell you when, goes back almost half a century. And uh, during that half century of teaching, I taught uh, 
like everybody else, which is very badly. There are very few teachers of language who really know what they're doing. And I, that's not my concern in, in this series, because I, I did not know when I got into doing that series that I'm going to meet on such a half hour these problems. They were generated by my students. I couldn't prepare myself to in the way you prepare a lesson. Because I didn't know what they were going to do with wha what I presented them. And often, they did things which were totally baffling to me, and I had to restructure myself emotionally and intellectually to be able to cope with what they had. But doesn't that mean that the, then the, the language itself has not been covered systematically? But who can cover the language? You know the language, and you can say, I'm covering systematically because you have a logical approach. But how can you say that this person in front of you is covering it? You're covering it. You're teacher, not the student. Yes, but if I'm responding to what the student is saying and not... And but not how could you be responding if your interest is on the language and not on the student? You want him to get, him or her to get what you're doing the way you're, th you're thought of it. This is the great defect of the teachings that is, uh, that subordinates learning. While if the teaching is subordinated to learning, then you let the students do what they are doing and you cope. We say, you get a, a stroke of genius, you say, do that, and they do it, and do that. You need lots of strokes of genius, one after the other, through the lesson. Yes, but if all of these strokes of genius ignore the conditional, and uh, aren't the students crippled when what they What do you mean, or, uh, ignore the conditional verb or the, condition, the conditional of the situation? The conditional of the situation. Of the situation? Yeah. I don't understand. Will you explain to me what is the condition of the situation? Oh, well, I was thinking actually the, condition, the situation in which the conditional verb is used. Oh, the conditional verb then. I understand that. Mm. Now, I have put on chart number four the conditional. And that means very early. In the books where that teach English as a second language, the conditional is on the second or third year. I put it on chart number four, which if I give six hours to each chart, it's 24 hours after you started that you get engaged with the conditional. And of course, I, it's so easy to create a situation in which you know <coughs> that you have to, to ask in your language something which is the conditional, even if the conditional is, doesn't exist as such. If I start a question by uh, an exchange, and uh, I, I begin, say, I'm going to illustrate it with a set of rods. Now, I take these rods, and I say to you, now, take two yellow rods, and you, you do it. And then I say to you, if you give me your two yellow rods, I give you this. Well, you may not want it. True. You may not want it because that's little compared to that. If you're greedy, a little greedy, you say no. And if I said, I'll give you this, if you, and then instead of saying now, if you give me these two, I say to you, if you gave me your two, I'll give you these with a twink, uh, twinkle in my eye so that you, you know that I am uh, uh, putting something which is more than an exchange of, two, of r rods which don't care. Yes, but how do, how do you think uh, I would necessarily understand the, the twinkle? Uh, I, well, I of, course, understand. of course, of uh, course, what, uh, what you understand is not my intention. What you understand is that uh, through the, the duality of first creating a climate in you of, of inequality, but in my favor, to inequality in your favor, that you, I'm acting upon you, your motivation, your human motivation, and you are greedy, slightly, hmm. slightly greedy. You would prefer that to the other one. And you would say yes, and, but I wouldn't give them to you until you say, you say the words, if you gave them. And now, then, when that's motivating you to, to learn the, con the conditional. Or I would do something else with other form. Uh, if you gave me them to me, oh, I'll put them there. Mm -hmm. Uh, now, mm -hmm. but if we come uh, if we come back to this uh, th this problem, there uh, we were in a situation where I could see I could see your reaction to what you were trying to achieve, the, the famous twinkle in the eye. But since you never appear on television, how can anyone see the, the twinkle in your eye? But because I have met, let my students do it. 
And since uh, there is a variety, if they have initiative in them, one of them will s start thinking, what a lovely game, I'm going to, to do something. And I would say, uh, I can prompt my students by making a sentence on the chart. Of course I can. And I can, make, I can do it before the, the, the tape, which I didn't do, because I wanted to be stricter with my experiment than is required. But there is no objection to you prompting your student through your, uh, in your uh, class and, uh, and ask one to, since we are using words that we know already, and we only make the change from give to gave. But there is the change from if, from, from give in one sense to suddenly if, if you give. Well, if you go back to the series, you will see that I covered the many, many expressions that can come out of chart number two. But I didn't touch if. I let if stay on the chart as a depository because it was printed on it. Then I did chart number three, which doesn't concern itself with if although gave was there. And uh, I may have used if with gave. Mm -hmm. But the conditional would and could and should are all there in chart number four. So I use it systematically from then on. And then I produce very many situations in which they can say, if, uh, uh, would you give me one of your rods? And the answer is, why should I? But is the meaning clear for the students on television and the students who are watching? Well, uh, if it's not sure, they are parrots. But then you have to test them. You have to test. And I think they were not parrots. And what they were doing was to, to put the stress and the intonation and the, the affective component, which is not visible uh, in, in it, to satisfy me that they weren't them. Of course, this element of non-visibility has been very little worked on by language teachers. We have been so successful in the sciences of nature that we have adopted everywhere a view from outside. So we operate on the visible, and we think that the invisible doesn't exist. I operate on the invisible. And I'm struck all the time, all the time that there is a perception of the invisible. There is a perception of what, uh, what is there to be, to be received by a sensitivity of what is not, not coming out in gestures or in uh, actions, but is certainly there. And you, you can say a teacher who works on himself or herself can become very sensitive, very vulnerable to this kind of operation on the part of students. And then you can say what the television approach does is to make visible the invisible. And you're struck by the fact that someone whom you don't see is bringing to the fore states of mind, uh, doubts, uh, responses that are indeed valid. They are helpful. Yes, well, it's, it's well and good to, to talk about the invisible, but people who may be using this, uh, this material in situations which are, are far removed from normal English teaching situations. I don't know, I think of people uh, who may have businesses in the center of a, uh, of a, of a large country, but uh, near no large city where there are no schools, there are no teachers, no one is, 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 is capable of, of working on that component. And the person who, who, has, who uses this material takes it and simply, he wants to know, how are my people going to look from the outside? How am I going to see my people operate in English? What is it going to do for them? Uh, uh, when I speak of the invisible, I'm concerned really with what I as a teacher had to do upon myself, on myself, in order to become as sensitive as possible to the linguist in my students. And looking from outside, you only see the stimulus and response. You give them some English, you get it back. And uh, what is visible is that they, or it means audible in this case, is that someone is uttering something that comes from within. And that something that comes from within, you have to give it a reality. Uh, the outside is objective. But do you consider it to be objective 
the movement within that says that uh, if I speak so of what the things I do, I have to use I, and if uh, you have just said something in which I was used, I have to refer to it when I look at you uh, by saying you, and when I look at others by saying he. Now this, these are the movements, they are not knowledge. This is not knowledge that you have to accumulate. You have to learn the transformation. You have to be sensitive to that which generates out of a statement that you put in circulation, all the statements that are possible because of what you already have within you. And I think that the, the grammar, the grammar is really part of you when by turning the face, you change the words. By thinking of, of the past or the future, you change the words. And th this dynamics, which is an invisible, is the one that is the object of your teaching. Not the words on the charts or the words on paper or the words on, on in the air. This is uh, it's an an another approach to, uh, to your students' activities. I can't say that every one of the students on the tape in my class demonstrated it to with such uh, uh, clarity uh, that, you, that everybody will get it from that. But as you go on, you will see that they are developing the insight. They are understanding that the requirements of language is not accumulation of vocabulary. To have words and words and words in you don't make you at all capable of saying, making a single sentence. Yes, but uh, a person who's learning this for, for professional reasons uh, needs uh, a certain professional vocabulary in order to be able to function in English. But and who has denied, who has denied that there will be a time where they have to learn uh, words that belong to the kitchen, words that belong to a machine, words that belong to office, words that belong to politics and diplomacy and so on. There's no doubt that these are the specialized areas. But if you look at your English, you will know that most of the words you use in order to make the grammar don't come from the, the special nouns that you use. They are all the little words, all the functional words which are given in this thing. What you're doing by giving them the functional vocabulary is to make them free to use themselves, saying that when the situation changes, and I'm referring to distance, these are the words I use, this close to me, and these close to me, if it's there are many, and that uh, is far, and those is far. Now these are the, the functioning which form the structure of each sentence. If you want to, to know what I know as the, the structure of a sentence, I take a sentence and shake it off of all nouns and some adjectives and verbs, and what's left is the structure. It's the structure, but for example, uh, the, the students in the series spend, what, uh, the first 80 hours, speaking of nothing but a rod. 60, 40 hours. 40 hours? That's the first right. 40 hours. 80, 80 segments. Huh? Speaking of the first 40 hours, I mean. Yeah. Uh, the first 80 segments. Speaking nothing, uh, of nothing but rods. Well, of course. Uh, why not? Uh, why not? If I take these two rods and I'm concerned with their distance, does it matter if they are uh, yellow, orange, and, and blue? Does it matter? Uh, but if I say that they are, they are being brought closer and closer and further and further away, am I not giving them the use of the English language, the proper English language, not rods and not uh, orange and blue? Yes, but don't they, doesn't a student get tired of uh, speaking of nothing but rods? Well, they may get tired. As far as I know, if we do the things in the manner that addresses itself to their interest, which is that they have realized that now, when they see something, the words come from within. The words come. And which are the words that come from within? They may, if you take the situation, a situation made with rods, the word rod has become what we call in French passepartout. It's a, a, an omnibus word. It is the one that you don't have to think about, although for many people it's a very difficult word to pronounce, and I keep it because it is a measure of how much they have 
acquired mastery of their utterance when they can say rod rather than lord or whatever they say in, uh, in so many different languages. But what you are concerned with really is the fact that when you perceive a relationship, you want to express the relationship in the English language. And you wouldn't want to have to learn the words for the relationship while you learn new words about other things. Now, I have used them as people and uh, started with the rod and when we, get, we got into them, you are on my right, where am I? On my left. Well, that you are not saying my words, I'm not saying your words, but we have to make this functional that the equivalent expression exists. If I'm the one who starts and I start with you, I have to say one thing. If I start with myself, I have to say something else. And that is transferable. And that is what we, that's what the language is about. Not the fact that your name is Roselle and mine Gatemi. This is uh, entirely irrelevant to the, to the learning of the language. And similarly, if you say this building is on the right of that building or that man is on the right of that woman, well, that's not added adding anything for the function of the language. I'd only say that you know that when this thing comes out, you say building, and this thing comes out, you say man, and this thing comes out, you say woman. Yes, but wouldn't it be easier and perhaps more uh, no, systematic to, to provide, uh, to provide uh, grammar lists or, or things that the students uh, well, could work I'm on. sure that you as a teacher have made the same mistake as I made and provided them and found that it wasn't of much use except to an exceptional student who could make sense of your nonsense. You see, I as a teacher failed so often that I couldn't say anymore, it's, the, it's their fault, which I used to say in the beginning, how stupid they are, until I realized how stupid I was. That was a turning point in my life to know how stupid I was in which pursuing my ideas instead of being with the reality. Who can say that it's sensible to think that the world has been created for me, for what I am, with what I am? It's absurd. The reality of your students' learning is not taken into account. However lofty your ideals are, you will not make them into speakers. And I know that you know this since uh, you have been sensitized, you have sensitized yourself to what good teaching and bad teaching is. Yes, but I've been in, many I've been in, in classes using the, the silent way. And I know that some students are uh, very disturbed by the fact that nothing seems very systematic. Uh, and they, they, don't, they don't get lists of words, they don't have anything to hold on to. And uh, isn't, uh, how do you deal with this? Well, I, you see, I'm not a politician and therefore I don't have to handle these matters which are political. Uh, I'm concerned with the anatomy of learning and teaching. And what I'm saying to you is common sense. If they have to use the language, they have to use it. And if they ha cannot learn it without making mistakes, they have to go through the mistakes. If I recognize that with, you can't operate with the language if you only have vocabulary, but you need to have a, a sense, a sense of all those things which we call the structures of the language, the nuance, the, the shades of meaning. You can't do that by simply giving uh, ex cathedra lessons uh, or giving, uh, saying, do this after me, repeat, we're going to Mexico, it's going to be a lovely journey, and so on. Now, uh, I, I sense, I sense after all these years of teaching languages that the, the series that we have prepared are very far ahead on the road to making the teaching of a language into a scientific activity. And I went to the, to the television, to the video, not because I, it's a bright idea. In fact, it's a terrible idea. It's just uh, uh, it's draining so much energy out of me. But it is the right idea. Not a bright idea, it's the right idea. 
If you want learning to take, pla to take place, show learning. If you want teaching to take place, show teaching. But why not in the classroom turn the students around from the, the students then and teach behind their back? Or but turn around but you and see don't face the students? But uh, yeah. the, when I put it on, on the medium, I make it available to the viewer. When I'm in the classroom, if I'm not there, what's producing it? You can't. You can't get students to produce, uh, uh, to invent what, is, what they can't invent. So I, I use common sense to say, don't ask children to, to learn what they already know, which so many teachers do. Don't ask them to do the impossible, which is to invent what they can't do. Uh, with these two components at your disposal, you certainly are better off. You are nourishing your students. You are giving them the chance to learn. And you know what the students were saying to each other in, uh, during uh, all these uh, hours of taping that we've had all these days. They spent the whole night speaking English. And they spoke much better in their sleep than when they were in the class. Because once you are awake, you are inhibited. An inhibited person, while when you are asleep, you are as free as you as a baby. So the learning that takes place in the classroom is the, the what do you call that? The charging of the students. During the lesson, they are charged. And when they sleep, they sort things out. So but that would mean when they got up, they would speak much better English. That's true, that's true. It's always true. But much better is a relative thing. Much better doesn't mean that after the first lesson they will be able to generate words they haven't, uh, haven't heard. They will be able to, to do what they couldn't do before. Much better. And I find this uh, to be the case again and again. Every student who goes to sleep on his uh, uh, lesson comes out with uh, a great deal more in him the next day. Yes, but then after, after 70 hours of... Uh uh, of English, if, if sleep were so powerful, yeah. how does it happen that the students aren't uh, completely because, bilingual? Because they solve their problem. They didn't solve your problem, which is to make a produce a miracle. They solve their problem. And if one was stuck that the only thing that matters in a language is vocabulary, and this man is not teaching me much vocabulary, and that person was certainly not mobilizing herself or himself. If another person said, but English is very difficult and stuck to it. Or, oh, I am so intelligent that I will pick it up in any case. Now, these were climates of students. And I had to cope with that. And you can't deny the reality of this. And when your students, the ones that you see on the tape, uh, show you, make the gift, as they do uh, after 60 hours. After 60 hours, they can string words. They can put the melody. It's extremely refreshing. If you go there with a, a, an ideal measure, if you say, only if you come at that level, there is water in the glass, then, of course, there is no water if it's below that level. Yes, but then what, are you saying that the, the, the material is not, uh, is not useful or interesting for students who, who have who've already managed to string words together? In what do you mean, the material? The material that is um, on the, the tape or the lesson? No, I mean the lessons on television. Is it? Uh, of course it is. I watch them. I am enthralled when I watch them. And they know everything. I was there. But I'm enthralled because there is something live. There, is, there are people there in front of you who are, with the whole of themselves, struggling to get something out. And when you get it out, what a victory. Now, that is contagious. And we teachers don't think of that. We think only of the conditional, or of the subjunctive, or the plural, or the category. Well, of course, these things exist in their language. I don't have to teach them this. I have to teach them how to get to enter into English with all their powers, with, uh, with uh, flying colors. Whatever they do is what they do. And for me to say they should have been there at that level is as unrealistic as saying that they should be speaking like me. They've done what they've struggled with, what they've struggled. And nobody knows, nobody on earth, including myself, what the viewers are going to do who are in Patagonia and in Timbuktu and somewhere in the 
uh, there's a thought failure. Nobody knows. And these people, when they are, they get the gift. They get the gift. Just as what, what you get when you, lo you look at other programs. If you could meet what I do, what I did in this stage, in the way you examine a basketball match on, te on television, you see people running and going up and down. They have people know how to run with the ball and so on. But after a while, you recognize that there was a situation that was difficult. There was something that they had to look to see how he span round himself and, and then go, uh, went round and, and it produced it all from how far he threw himself and missed it. But that's, well, a, very, right. yes, but that's a very good example. Yeah. Uh, no one could learn to play basketball watching television. How could you learn to play basketball watching television? How can you learn to speak English? Uh, but of course you can't learn basketball. But the fact that you watch it tells you that you are involved in something called basketball. Otherwise, you say, that's golf, or it's, uh, it's uh, croquet, whatever. It's. You say it's basketball because you are involved with the, the ball that goes in the basket. And you have de developed the criteria of the person who is viewing. But you see, in the basketball, they didn't do what I did in the film, in the tape. In this stage, I put learning so that it comes to you. And since it comes to your ear, and you can utter the sound. We've tried it quite a number of times since we have been making these tapes, although it's only recent. Quite a number of times we have seen people in front of the, uh, the, the TV set doing what the people there do. And one and a half hours later, you could go and listen. And that person who was uttering things was uttering English, who didn't know any when coming to in front of that. And now, these are, this is evident, and anybody can have it. The rest is politics. And I'm not a politician. I'm an empiricist. I have had to change myself in order to cope with the challenge. I ask you, would you try to be a little less on your guard, a little less on the defensive, and not ask this to do what you wanted to do, but ask yourself, what did it do? What is it doing? If you take that attitude of a scientist, what is it doing? You will find a great deal more. That, but if you say it should produce this, it doesn't. It, it, certainly, I acknowledge immediately. I am not a ma miracle uh, maker. Not at all. But every one of these people uh, performed a miracle during these weeks. They come out uttering on after 60 hours, after 60 hours, they make long statements, complex statements, with many changes, with uh, lots of, of different ideas, and they make them right. You were there. You can't deny that. No? Well, then why ask for what not, has not been attempted? I don't know whether we can make 200 hours of television tapes. I wouldn't attempt it, because I don't think that's the purpose of teaching. It is, my purpose is to provide the students the platforms, the springboard from which they can take the flight and go as high as, soar as far as they can. And some people there have soared so high, although they don't reach your level of sight, because they started from so low, and they reached below your sight. But if you look at them, and you look at what they did with themselves, you could say, it is extremely powerful. And if there is someone in Kuwait, or some other one in Formosa, or some other one anywhere uh, uh, trying to, to do the same job at their level, it would be a tremendous inspiration. And who can deny the role of inspiration in learning and in teaching? Well, if we change the, uh, the, the direction, uh, and look at the tapes as part of a, of a total teaching environment. How would you see teachers using them? First, uh, I would think that they need to be prepared innerly to accept that it is not classroom teaching. They have to know that we are trying to use the medium for what it is as powerful as it is to do powerful things with it. Then I would say, will they find a place for them 
which is not to subordinate the tape to their idea of teaching, but subordinate their teaching to what the tape can do, which means that they can find a place in it. They can enter after the first half hour or, or after the seventh half hour. That, I wouldn't uh, direct anybody to do it in this way at that, at that place. But I would certainly think that there is a place for a sensitive teacher to come in and say, I have additional tools at my disposal. They are available with the series. They are given. We put them in the teacher's room. They study these things as well. And they arrange their classroom in such a way that after viewing a certain number of half hours, they can have a dialogue with them, silent dialogue, by, by pointing at some statements with the things and asking them to make them and asking them to execute them. Since the verbs that I use in the chart number one are all action verbs, they will be able to do that. They could put, they could ask them to take a certain number of rods and put them end to end or to get up and uh, ask someone else to get up too. Tell someone else to get up too and get up on my right, get up on my left and things of this kind which can be naturally you have to wait uh, till chart number three to take the words le left and right. But it's not so long after that. It's, it's, it's quite, quite quickly in terms of your, your transfer. You can get these people to write. You can give them paper to write. You know, in our approach, in the series itself, we have introduced the numerals very early. The numerals come early because they, they have two advantages. Students understand them at once, if they are not first graders. They understand them at once. And they provide a, a, an arena for the initiative of students who can write any length, any uh, numerals, a, num uh, a numeral of any length. And they can enter into the reading of it by putting the melody and the right sound and so on, because they are only, only 20, 22 things they have to remember for in the numerals for English. And after that, or oh, say 25, but you have counted them so precisely. These 25 things, if practice, and, and I practice a lot in the tape with them, then you give them an example. They write anything they want. They bring it to themselves. They write any number of them to practice as much as they want. And then they show it to their neighbor, if need be. And the neighbor gets this example or reciprocates. And so they, they have a field very early. I think it goes from the chart number six or seven to chart 13 or so, you know, uh, or 12. And you can see very half, the first half hour, uh, 12, six hours after they started, they are mouthing in English a long string of things on which they can work to, to improve themselves, not to perfect themselves, as I was going to say, to improve themselves. There are precise points where they can improve themselves. And once they breathe, they take their, their uh, they gather their energy and throw themselves to a 27 figure number. And they the exhilaration is positive it counts as a further motivation for later. Now, if you knew of other areas than these, I have given them all the sound and practice of it, all the numerals and practice it. Then I give them the rods and the number of verbs and uh, all the relationships with the chart. And now, that is the content of what I consider the platform for soaring. After that, teachers can teach them what they know to how to do so well, which is conversation. You can speak spontaneously, and I can relate to your spontaneity with mine. And you can come in and say, mm, not that. Listen, and with your hands, go back to my techniques and make the words change the place by turning, twisting your figure, fingers or turning around or doing this, doing certain thing, or using your fingers to force them to change vowel here. Yes, but doesn't that require a great deal of training? Training. Yes, for teachers, right. Well, that's the training for the silent way. It's not to do with the television. The new one, the new training for television is early to become sensitive, to enter at the right moment 
to help rather than hinder. But uh, what, are the, what are the criteria exactly for doing this? Well, you get the response from them. If they tell you, don't tell me, you know that they prefer to say it on their own. If, you, if they are rude, they will say, shut up. But if they say, if they are only with the vocabulary I gave them, they will say, uh, don't tell me. Don't tell me. I'll try on my own. The word try has been put in circulation very early. Don't tell me. Or say something. You see, uh, uh, I, am, I can't say that the panacea. I can't say that we have solved all the problems. But we have taken teaching of language so far ahead on the road by, by bending, by bowing to the reality of learning languages and using the tremendous power that television has, has because people give themselves to it. That's exceptional in a class that the students give themselves to this. Here they give themselves. They've done it every time they put any show, any commercial. They give themselves to it. Now this gift, I don't want to lose. And being the first one to try this, I, I'm a pioneer, but I'm not shooting in the dark. I have done things in this series which, by which I can stand. There are things that I can improve, of course, but I can stand by these things with the totality of my integrity. And I would like every one of those who come to this to feel the same. There are blemishes, there are weaknesses, there are things that you, you can talk about, but only in heaven do we find people who have no faults. On earth, with all the things we do, uh, we, are, we have tried to give this medium a place in, the lang in teaching language. And before this effort of ours, all you had on it were shows with people doing things rather than anything else. Doing things. Well, do the students at home, will they be able to do things the way the students at the, in the studio? How will they uh, be able to, 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 to respond to that's this? That's a matter of administration. If there is a center for distribution of materials, they can get materials too. They can, uh, we have materials for students and we can develop materials for students once we are in, in this uh, operation. We can adequate material. For the moment, that's what we are. But can you tell me in what way, uh, quickly, take a minute, not a minute and a half, not more, mm -hmm. to tell me in what way you have been changed by this conversation? Well, I, uh, I think uh, basically the way I've been changed most is the discussion on the, uh, the use of mistakes and blemishes. Um, the mistakes by the students and the, the blemishes of the, of the tape which seem to me to give, uh, to give a feature to the whole experiment. Um, I know that during the actual filming or shooting of the series, um, I was definitely more concerned or concerned much of the time as a teacher and as someone who speaks the English language, uh, perhaps more so than I was uh, involved or sensitive to what was going on in the television. And it seems to me that the, the discussion that we've had concerning that particular aspect uh, has uh, given me at least uh, a reason to pause and uh, reconsider on my own position. Uh, the, other, the other aspect is the, the aspect of the mistakes of the students and exactly how they, uh, they seem to, to generate in students uh, the awareness that I've seen here uh, in the evaluation group itself. So that one person knew that that was not the person to listen to at that particular time. But also, how that happened to change. And I think that the, the emphasis on mistakes and on the learning for television is uh, perhaps the most remarkable and, and revolutionary part of the entire, uh, the entire discovery. I'm convinced that we've done something very revolutionary, but very worthwhile. And if you share that, it's all right.